hey, in that case, let's just kick it right off there because we don't <laughs> we don't talk we don't talk during the week. This is when we talk. Uh, we used to go to the comic shop. It take it's. Oh, I lost Nate. Camera. Oh no. How did you lose me? I'm still here. Your camera is all squaggles. Okay, well, let me turn it off and turn it back on again. <laughs> At the moment I hit record, his camera's like, yeah, fuck you. Um, hey, little teapot. Oh, it's reconnecting. Yay! Okay. He has returned. Um, <laughs> anyway, hey, hi, hello. It's me, Chris, a.k.a. Tom Burrito, along with... Nate, a.k.a. Little Teapot. For another yeah. episode. Stop on the 89. You don't use the 89 anymore. It's different everywhere. Ah, uh, yeah. Well, technically... Another episode of Space Time Talker. Welcome. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it. Um, <laughs> anyway, Nate, uh, <laughs> how have you been? <laughs> I've I've been both present and non, depending on the day of the week. Okay, okay, all right. Um, well, hey, you know what? It's been two weeks. Uh, I have still not really had the the time or chance to just sit around and play video games or catch up on anything. Um, oh wait, I'm actually kind of lying. I did play a game, but we'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, the most important thing right now. Today is the 27th of August. Later this week, on the 31st, the last day of the month, we get the first season, hopefully just the first season, we get more after, in my, in my opinion, in my hope, let me hope, um, of the live-action One Piece. Which means it's time for a, Netflix, or a, a One Piece check-in, Nate. Where are you? Where are we going? How are we doing? What'd you watch? You catch up? You you get to where I told you to? I haven't gotten where you told me to, but I've made it further than I thought I would. Alright, what episode um, number? So, well, let's find out. Um, I watch a lot of this on my iPad in bed, because I'm fucking lazy. Mm -hmm. So, if I go to Crunchyroll right now... I want to say you are at least to Sanji. So, yes, I have passed Sanji. Ooh! Um, I am currently on episode... It's got to be 33 or 34 right now. Oh, damn! All right, you are definitely going to yeah. catch up. You no, are... I, yeah, well, just before we started recording, I was on 34. So, I'm in Arlong Park. Nami is doing Nami things. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, just for random reference, um, me personally... Uh, because I have not been really feeling watching anything new. Um, I'm kind of just putting things on that I know no stories and stuff and just letting it happen. Uh, so I've been just throwing on One Piece. I've never watched the anime beyond what we've talked about before. You've already surpassed where I've gotten in the actual show. Um, again, I read it. I don't watch it. I am currently <laughs> on... Uh, I've jumped in just because I wanted to watch certain storylines. Uh, I am currently on episode 267. Um, oh now, I didn't watch all the way up until 267. I specifically started at the beginning of an arc. Um, mm -hmm. I've already done that for one arc. I, I went to a specific arc, uh, and it's an arc that people skip. Nate, I'm telling you now, do not skip any manga canon arcs. <laughs> uh have you had to skip filler yet i don't i don't even know when the filler happens not, i mean not really the the weird thing about the way one piece does filler early on is it's it's less filler and more of them still filling in backstory and doing world building on stuff um you know the the hard thing to always interpret with things like manga or anime is until you see the the full vision the whole picture of say a season or a series it a lot of it feels like the mangaka or the authors were just making it up as they went um it feels a little bit different with one piece because nami's betrayal of the crew makes more sense in the context of what she was doing before she even you know joined luffy mm -hmm. um <clears throat> And so it is 
this one is not so much throwing me for a loop where a lot of filler episodes that do this kind of thing where they exposit and fill in backstory and stuff like that normally is for the sake of convenience in a lot of anime and it's because the author usually forgot to do something or is too lazy to find a more creative way to implement that part of a character's backstory mm -hmm. um one piece is different and i mean 30 episodes and i'm three percent of, <laughs> of this anime done now um but in that three percent there's still so much to to enjoy about it because it is well crafted it is well written um and all the characters are pretty interesting i mean even when that's not three we, we, <laughs> Well, it's a little less than 3% now. <laughs> I get, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. My brain is like, wait, how many episodes are there? But, um... <clears throat> no, I mean, even even in those episodes where you get, like, these flashback segments, like, they're not so drawn out that it's like, oh, this was just a filler episode to fill in a character's backstory. Mm -hmm. Um... <clears throat> so, I don't know. I mean, I'm excited to see where it's going. This whole thing between, you know, between Nami and Arlong... Um, I'm excited to see that play out. I'm pretty sure Luffy's going to end up fighting Arlong because he just has to beat every bad guy in the show. So um, I'm excited to see how that turns out. Uh, so according, I just happened to I jumped on anime filler list. Um, so there isn't actually what is considered a full filler episode until 54 episodes in. Um, episode one through 53 are either full canon. Um, is it full canon, mixed canon, or what is considered anime canon, which is usually like it's expanding on what it already existed in the uh, um, in the manga, or will take like a small side thing and be like, let me make this into a whole a story. Um, so that's actually kind of interesting. I like that. Uh, I will say I know from looking at other things that uh, there are some. Like, all that backstory stuff is just in the manga. Um, the order that some of the backstory stuff happens is a little different, I think. Uh, like, Luffy's whole backstory, I think... I don't know. I think it comes earlier in the in the manga. Um, like, the whole, like, what happened when he actually eats it. I don't know. It's, mm -hmm. I, it's been forever. I, wanted, I, I keep meaning to go back and, like, restart it just because I'm like, what the fuck, why not? Um... But yeah, I don't know. I'm glad that you're enjoying it. Um, you were very close to the spot that everybody's like, and this is a show that I'm never dropping. Uh, <laughs> which is impressive. That's fast, man. That's, uh, what is it? You're basically half hour episodes, 20 minute episodes, times yeah. 30 something. Yeah. I mean, I, I take the time and whenever I'm not doing anything, I'm only picking up my iPod or I'll flip on my TV and put on Crunchyroll and watch some One Piece. Um, this is just... I, I at least do want to get to this 44th episode so I can be ready for this live action thing. Um, because everything I, I've seen about the live action makes it feel like uh, this is one of the very few like live action adaptations that people actually give a shit about and isn't just like a really quick cheapo crash cash grab for some studio in Japan. Yeah, the fact uh, that uh, the fact that Oda has been like hands on with the entire uh, production is very, one very interesting because I feel like that is not something that normally happens with these. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even think uh, my mind's blanking on his name, but the creator of uh, Cowboy Bebop like had anything to do with it. Um, which is disappointing. I, again, I am, along with a handful of other people that I know, somebody that really enjoyed it because mm -hmm. it ha had played with it. It had fun in the world, it did its own thing, uh, and I don't think it changed anything for the worse, right? Mm -hmm. Is that what I'm saying? For the worse? If you can change things yeah. for the better, <laughs> then you can change things for the worse. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, it, like, in the fact that I think the most upsetting thing is my favorite character doesn't get introduced until the end and they don't even get to really do anything because the show gets cancelled. Uh, <laughs> because fuck Netflix. Um, I don't know. But yeah, like I said, it, I mean, they are they are going so in on this. I'm really hoping that it's it's Netflix believing in it, even with no proof yet, technically. Um, well, 
I mean, I saw like the guy who plays Sanji in this live action. Um, he did a lot of stuff just to prepare for his role as Sanji. Mm-hmm. Um, he took up kickboxing, like trained in kickboxing. And now it's like a hobby of his. Um, he went to culinary classes to learn to cook, like for real. <laughs> um, so he did a lot of stuff to sort of embody these these aspects of his character. So he's not just a dude on screen kind of pantomiming everything Sanji would be doing. Yeah. Um, and again, the casting choices for this are great. I, I know how Japan cast its char- cast its characters for a lot of live action adaptations of things. Like, no one can tell me the kid who played Light in the live action Death Note, not the Netflix one, the one that was released in Japan, um, would look, sound, or just be like anything like Light would be in that show. Um, but like, the guy they cast for Luffy. Fucking brilliant casting decision. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I think it was Oda that was quoted in saying that it, he he is Luffy. Um, mm-hmm. Like they, he, he, I know. Yes, sure. You can say he's just talking up the adaptation and all that, but like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel like the creator you can trust a little bit more when it comes to like this situation. Yeah. Um, I do like the theories that some people are having, and I can't remember if we've talked about it before. Um, people are theorizing that there are going to be things that happen in the live action that are going to be like easter eggy kind of hints to the future of the actual manga um Mm -hmm. which is something that like he he does in the manga he does it in certain movies in anime in the anime hinting at the future of the entire series kind of stuff uh Mm -hmm. so i'm excited i am very excited to see what happens yeah i mean well we're we're all waiting with bated breath i'm sure (laughs) um Thankfully, there's I have of... an episode of Ahsoka to hold me over until then. Yeah. Well, there's a lot of One Piece fans out there, and everyone is, is clamoring for this. Um, well, speaking of Ahsoka... <laughs> have you watched the first two episodes, Dane? Yes, I've watched oh, thank both God. episodes of Ahsoka. Okay, okay. Um, now, technically, uh, this is a really fun situation. We can technically give spoilers. I will give the spoiler warning. I do not have a spoiler cover. Sorry. Um, but technically, nothing really gets spoiled in this, uh, for the most part. Uh, mm-hmm. What I will say is, it is a very interesting way to start a series, where this series starts, these two episodes start before the epilogue of Rebels. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is a really interesting thing. They basically remake the final scene from Rebels as the last part of the second episode. Um, and that's kind of fucking awesome. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as somebody that has read all, or read all, watched all of Rebels, I am so fucking excited for this show. Um, I don't, did you ever watch Rebels? I can't remember. Yes, I did watch Rebels. Okay. Did you finish Rebels? I believe I finished it, except for the epilogue. <laughs> well, the epilogue was just literally like a single quick thingy. Mm. Okay. Well, um, yes, I finished Rebels. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, it like has the whole like Hera and and um, mm. and Rex fought in on the Battle of Andor. Uh, mm-hmm. Not Andor, 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 Andor. <laughs> Andor's Andor. the show. Battle he he been dead. He been dead. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So what what did you think overall? First two episodes in? I think it was great. Um, There are... I'll put it this... I mean, I've said this before and I have to say it again. When you put a property like Star Wars in the hands of people who actually like Star Wars but are also technically gifted enough to create new Star Wars content, you get shows like Ahsoka and like Andor, which are probably the two best Star Wars shows to come out in recent memory um <clears throat> and that's exactly what dave filoni and john favreau have done um they know what makes star wars compelling what makes it interesting and what makes it fun and they kind of bring that energy to everything that they've produced so far uh <clears throat> you know when 
there there are <laughs> I don't know how to put this, but there are there are technical things you can see. There there are things that I notice even on on first viewing that I see where I go that enhances Star Wars. Um they're using CGI a whole lot more cleverly than George Lucas ever did for a lot of stuff. Um well, to, to be fair, yeah. it's a lot better it's than it was, too. A lot more advanced than it was, yes. But George, I'll just put it this way. Despite the lack of advancement, George Lucas seemed kind of obsessed with saturating a lot of movies with CGI. Um, which, you know, he wanted certain effects. He wanted certain things. We understand what he was trying to achieve. And, you know, I can't criticize him too harshly for that. Uh but there are things that I noticed, and none of this is spoilers content, because this isn't even about the story of this show. Um, this is just technical things that I noticed. First of all, lightsaber sounds. Every lightsaber that I've heard activate or do anything in this show sounds different than every other lightsaber in the same show. And I fucking love that. Um, a big part of the reason why I like Jedi Survivor is when you change your lightsaber color it mm -hmm. doesn't just change the color it changes the sound your lightsaber makes um and this is because for those who like are little lore rats like i am and go and read wikis and shit nerds lore rats. um lore <laughs> <rats>. <laughs> not the lore rats. Um, he, he speaks for the trees <laughs> yes um no, you know, you know that lightsabers are not just like this fancy weapon that Jedi and Force sensitives wield. It's kind of tied to the user's personality, to mm -hmm. their style, to the way they speak to people, how they fight. Everything is tied to their lightsabers. Their lightsabers are kind of a rep representation of who they are as people. Um, and so when we hear, you know, Ahsoka's lightsabers turn on, they're first of all you see them and just white lightsabers i mean when we saw that in clone wars like that was unique to begin with then you saw it in rebels um and then when you finally got like the full live action realized version in mandalorian everyone was like holy shit white lightsabers are a thing um <laughs> but they look they pretty make, badass they do look badass and they make a really cool sound you hear Ezra's lightsaber turn on, that makes a cool sound. You hear the bad guy's lightsabers turn on, that makes a cool sound. So, all that stuff. The other big technical thing just about lightsabers alone is, and this goes all the way back to, like, episode six in the movies, is I love that lightsabers now make visible fucking light. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like, before, lightsabers, like, they were cool, but they weren't present. Now they're present. They have this kind of feel to them as if they're part, they're physical part of the world. They're a physical thing that these people have to interact with. Um, and that just enhances these scenes with these lightsaber fights so much more. Uh, and beyond that, I mean, they keep up with the action, the humor, all that stuff is still present and it's all still very star Wars at the end of the day. But uh, yeah, I'm going to shut up now. I talk too much. <laughs> No, stop. Um, no, yeah, I like. I would say, like I said, I went into this just hoping for another season of Rebels, um, but in live action, and that's basically what we have. Um, the uh, as amazing as the first two episodes are, in my opinion, my favorite part, my favorite scene, is um, the return in the first real live action we already saw him in rogue one very small part didn't actually have any lines um but getting to see chopper in live action uh and have the most like <laughs> understandable mm -hmm. droid speak um fantastic continue continues to be a war criminal uh, <laughs> like he literally asks in, in why it's a problem to drop a ship on a planet or uh, on a city. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. I absolutely love it. Um, but no, seeing, seeing Chopper come back, obviously still voiced by Dave Filoni, like I said, made to be a little bit more note or understandable. Um, 
mm-hmm. which, which like I've seen so many people put subtitles on him talking. Oh, yeah. um, I think uh, getting oh my brain is blanking on, on her name uh, Ramona Flowers um, <laughs> Mary Elizabeth Winstead uh, Mary Elizabeth Winstead as Hera is great. Um, I love mm-hmm. that now her and her husband are part of Star Wars. Um, and if you don't know her, who her husband is, her husband is Obi-Wan motherfucking Kenobi. Um, mm-hmm. Which I found out more recently. I didn't realize they were together. But uh, good for yeah. both of them. Two very attractive people. Um, I think she's taller than he is. <laughs> who knows? I don't know. Um <laughs> Kim has pointed out multiple times that uh, whoever did the costume design, pants look great mm-hmm. on her. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so does TikTok. TikTok is a big fan of the outfit. Um, mm-hmm. But no, she's great. I think it's a, a great choice. Like, obviously, it's hard to do live action versions of of cartoon characters because Mm -hmm. most of the time those voice actors don't match that character. Um, Yeah. Now I could technically see uh, Ahsoka's voice actress, her original actress. um, I could see her point, pull it off. Uh, I think she's Mm -hmm. done it before. Like she's dressed up in costume as it before. Um, But obviously having Mm -hmm. more of a presence of somebody like Rosario Dawson, Fan fucking tastic. Who doesn't love her? Um, oh yeah. I literally just Not looked at the name and I just completely forgot. Yeah, Ashley Dick. It Ashley Eckstein. Eckstein mm-hmm. Eckstein. Um, who is also the voice of uh, uh, my brain? I gotta stop trying to think things. Think, <laughs> think, think things. Didn't she do something on that one show with the, the avatars? Maybe I'm thinking of somebody else. I am thinking of somebody else. No. Whatever. Know. Uh, anyway, great, great choices for all these actors. Um, you know what? It is funny that I said that. I forgot that there is one of the voice actors that is going to be playing their live action version. Uh, and we just haven't gotten to him yet. Um, hopefully soon. I hope we don't have to wait too long to see Thrawn. Um, I forgot, I completely forgot that they were using, uh, him to actually come back as the live action version and I for, I think that's fucking amazing. Um if you don't know it's uh ooh Nate my brain <laughs> Lars Nicholson. Thank you. It I was like it's Mad's brother. Yes. No, the the crazy thing about about Lars Nicholson as well is his face is well, I'll put it this way. Thrawn's face because he is a species in Star Wars called Chiss, which are these blue humanoids with red eyes. As in give me very, a... well, Yeah, I mean, his face is very gaunt. And the great thing about Lars Mikkelsen the is his face thing. is also that she... <laughs> Not the great, the great thing about him. This man is also gaunt as fuck. Um... <laughs> this man is also starving himself <laughs> to play Star Wars. <laughs> That's just his face. It has nothing to do with Star Wars. Um... I mean, because the first thing I've ever I ever saw him in was, uh, at least from what I remember, is Sherlock. Um, mm-hmm. Could it have been something else? Maybe, but the first thing I think of when I think of him is Sherlock. Obviously, as in, sorry, first thing I think of what I knew him in is that, and then obviously, more notably to me is fucking Rebels. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I almost I completely forgot that he was coming back to be the live action. So I think that's funny. That was what that whole conversation just was. Um, but no, I uh, one of the things that I'm also excited about is the fact that not only yes, live action versions of so many things. This is also, to my memory and knowledge, the first live action version of a Night Sister. Um, yeah, which. Yes, I love the Night Sister shit. It got a little bit too much near the end of of Clone Wars, um, especially when I think at one point Jar Jar Binks foils them. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, just seeing the first ever representation of of the Night Sisters is an interesting thing to finally see. Uh, I know people are also pointing out that the whole little ball thing that shows a map is. Uh, basically just treasure planet 
I mean, <laughs> yes, but Treasure Planet also <laughs> borrowed that from how many other, you know, fantasy and sci-fi stories. Yeah, you um, know, people people in the Disney fandom just want want Treasure Planet to get its uh, its uh roses. It's a map that needs the key, and it's a ball shape. It's yeah. in everything. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> no. So yeah, like I said, don't want to go into too much spoilers and things. Um, I am already a fan of the older of the the villains. Um, rest in peace to him. I can't remember the actor's name, but unfortunately he passed away after filming this series. Um, Ray Stevenson, I believe? Ray Stevenson? Yeah. Yes, there was a tribute yeah. to him at the end of episode one. Yeah, like for Ray or something like that. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it, like him just in these first two episodes i'm like i want to see him in more things and i forgot that i had seen him in more things he was one of thor's friends uh, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunately he no longer is live in that series either um mm-hmm. but yeah uh I, i'm very excited to see where we're going like i said this is just basically a prequel what we got was a prequel to the actual series because it was still all taking place within the same timeline as rebels um yeah so we get the ugh, we get so much because this is post post original trilogy with people that are from pre trilogy. Ah. <laughs> well, again, I, I'm enjoying. Hang on, can you hear me now? Good. Oh, I was hearing you the whole time. Okay. Um. No, I'm enjoying again this this period of Star Wars we're in. It's a whole lot of great and wonderful content to experience. Um, done well. It's done well, and so it's a massive corpse. Why did I say corpse? Why did that word come out of my mouth? Uh-huh. Massive corpse correction. <laughs> massive corpse correction. You know, like Weekend at Bernie's. They're controlling a dead body. <laughs> I'm secretly a necromancer. That's what I am. <laughs> That's what the hood's spell, for. One of my spell is called corpse correction. <laughs> <laughs> oh Jesus! <laughs> no, um, but it is a course correction from you know the sequel trilogy and kind of the crap we had to deal with, you know, going through that. Um, it's it's bringing Star Wars back on track, and there's still always that speculation in the air of will this help? Not maybe decanonize that sequel trilogy, but help place it in a better context within the Star Wars timeline and universe. When you um, said air, I thought you were going to say something about air to the empire, which is like where people think this whole thing is going to be heading towards. Uh, <laughs> I fucking hope not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it just, even if it just recontextualizes the sequel trilogy in a way where a lot of the events that were kind of rushed through, especially in the first movie, make more sense, that would help. I mean, we're already getting things like Imperial Spies and Imperial Remnant Traitors and stuff like that. Well, and I feel like uh, this has been kind of like an overall for all of these post-original trilogy and even some of the the pre-original trilogy stuff that they're expanding on. I feel like all of it, to a certain extent, is filling in answers. Sometimes it's stuff we don't need answers for, like the whole star, the so- Solo saga talking about his past and all that wasn't handled the greatest wasn't exactly what we needed answered things that didn't really matter um rogue one obviously was more of a how did this all happen it was a question of well, how did this get how did this pull off how did the the ragtag rebellion somehow take down the big bad like this uh and that was really cool that is still one of my favorite movies that they've made since disney got their hands on it um but it is something that, in my opinion, has had kind of held back with Clone, or, uh, not Clone Wars, but um, Bad Batch in Mandalorian. Um, I don't think it really got touched on in Boba Fett, but just all of these shows have kind of been like, oh, here's secretly some of the plots that have to do with how we got the return of, uh, of uh, fucking Palpatine and Snoke and all that kind of stuff because we get like oh here are all these clones here's 
We're kidnapping specifically a guy that was working on clone technology. We're working directly with the original people that worked on the clone program for the uh, clone troopers. Um, and it's just constantly being like little bits and pieces of, hey, we're kind of explaining away why all that happened. So I am in the camp of like, they are not going to decanonize it. They are putting way too much effort into trying to make more sense of it. Um, does it suck that that last movie sucked? Yes. Because that first movie was a fun kickback into Star Wars. Yes, sure, it's a retread of a lot of older content or whatever, updated versions of older content. Um, and I know everybody has different opinions on uh, Last Jedi. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I stand by it. Stand by it. Um, but yeah, move beyond that. We're getting good shit. Even with the bad... We're still able to get really, really, really good. Um, yeah. So, anyway. Well, speaking of really, really, really good, Nate, uh, <laughs> I, this last week, did a double feature. Yes, Nate, I saw both of these movies on this list, one after the other. Um, can you guess the order of which I did this? <laughs> I'm just going to say you saw, well, the, this one first. Yes, you are correct. Uh, I, this last week, did a double feature of Talk to Me and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. Um, I originally wasn't going to, but the anxiety and stress that the first movie gave me made me realize I needed something a lot lighter to bring me back down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that being said, Talk to Me, fantastic fucking movie. Um, it's very short. About I think it's about an hour and a half long. Do that more often, filmmakers. I love movies, I am an old man, and I get sleepy now. So if you give me a three-hour movie, I don't know if I'm going to make it. Um, <laughs> unless it's the Batman. Somehow the Batman kept me focused and awake. Uh, Dune <laughs> got a little sleepy. Uh, <laughs> but no, uh, talk to me. If you haven't seen it, it is the movie about um, these kids, teenagers, um, maybe teenagers? I don't know how old they are now I think about it. Uh, that basically are playing this game with a possibly embalmed hand, plaster hand, no real reveal of what it actually is happens. Uh, spoilers, I guess. Um, gonna be as little spoilery as possible. Um, but no, uh, there's hand, they touch the hand, they basically say, talk to me, and then when they when they're touching the hand and say that a random spirit appears in front of them, um, and then they allow it into them to possess them, and that is kind of like the high that they in, uh, I don't know are after, uh, <laughs> and it's basically the event story or series of events that go horribly wrong when. They when you let, let it, spirits possess you? <laughs> well, well, you're only supposed to do it for a certain amount of time. Um, it's safe as long as it's under 90 <laughs> seconds. Uh, <laughs> this sounds like every drug dealer I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, so it. what happens is uh, one of the characters gets possessed for too long uh, and... Bad shit continues from there on. I don't want to go into spoilers. But what I will say is... It is not a straight-up horror movie. Um, like, if you get scared easily... Yes, you will be scared of shit. You will be fully shitless. You will need three more pairs of pants <laughs> after you leave this theater. Um, just watch it on a toilet. <laughs> yeah, just prepare. Keep yourself ready. Um I will admit, I almost saw this in a theater by myself, and I probably wouldn't have been able to handle that, but that's also mm -hmm. kind of like a, I don't like seeing movies in a theater alone to begin with, because I've had to do that before, and it was for a kid's movie, and it was still creepy as shit. Uh, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> big empty theater, one person? No, I feel like I'm going to be murdered. Um, there's, there's a reason I didn't see the My Little Pony movie in theaters. Because <laughs> you didn't want to be made fun of by me, I know. Um oh, no. No, fucking movie. Uh, yeah, I went to see Missing Link, and I was the only person in the theater, so it was very upsetting. Um, but anyway, not super straightforward horror. Can be scary if that's, like, if you are weak, uh, sensitive to that kind of thing. Um, 
little little gory, not super gory. Uh, there's only like one or two scenes that are very like that'll make you a bit. Um, but what I what <coughs> excuse me, what I wasn't expecting was how emotional this movie got. Um, like at one point, I was actually tearing up a bit. Um, and of course, I knew it was going to go all downhill from there, but still. Uh, I I absolutely love this. I want these. Oh, what is this group called? It's like Raka Raka. Yeah, Raka Raka. Um, it's an Australian YouTube channel from the twins Danny and Michael Filopi. Philo- Filopi. Um, yeah, it's known for intense live action horror comedy videos. Which makes sense. Not super comedy, I'm going to tell you that now. Not the super comedy side of this. Much more horror than comedy. Um, but fantastic. I would love to see more of this. Or more of this from them. Uh, on top of that, I also want to shout out the main actress in this film. Whose name is just bl- Sophie Wilde. She was fan-fucking-tastic. Um... I will say one thing, cool thing about this movie. Uh, it's Australian. Or I think Australian. <laughs> it takes place in Australia. Uh, so, you know. I, I gotta admit, I think if it was a whole bunch of, of Americans, I wouldn't have enjoyed it as much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It's something about it. Just adds that little bit of a flair to it. Um, but no. An American dies on screen. That's what you fucking I'm like, yeah, right. okay, I'm used to this. <laughs> um, but no, yeah. Sophie Wilde, fantastic. I want to see her in so many more things. Uh, I, I, such a good movie I want to watch it more but I have too many other movies I need to watch in theaters before they leave I'm probably already missing like two or three um, one of which was the other movie that I watched the new Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles oh, uh, excuse me. I'm drinking my Dr. <laughs> Pepper too fast I'm getting burpy that's what happens when you eat you drink and then talk a lot mm-hmm. anyway Nate have you seen the new turtle movie I have not I, I do want to. Um, that being said, I am coming off the back of a story as grim and as serious as The Last Ronin. Uh, <laughs> then you definitely need this. Um. <laughs> this is just a total tonal shift in the world of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I like quick go through some of the highlights. Love the animation style. Um, there are certain moments in the movie that it feels like it's almost claymation the way that it's animated um Mm -hmm. obviously a lot of people call out that they feel like it's heavily influenced by uh the spider 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 verse films and i i guess i can see that but i feel like that's mostly because it's takes place in the in like the dark and there are bright colors i don't know um well also like i don't understand if people are using that as a dig at the film to say that it's it's inspired by I think it's like a, oh, it kind of makes me think of Spider-Man, and Spider-Man's awesome. Um, okay. I, I can't remember. There was a interview at one point that they basically described the style as if kids drew the turtles, if this was like mm-hmm. everything was wrong. And I mean, it's people aren't like, they no, very little symmetry, symmetry in the movie. Um, the most symmetrical people, oddly enough, are the turtles probably with their head shapes. <laughs> um and I thought that was a really cool idea. Uh, it kind of... I don't know. I, I really enjoyed because it's it's like the, the 3D style animation. Explosions are 2D. Certain things are rendered in 2D. Like it looks just like a hand-drawn explosion or fire or something like that. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought that looked really fucking cool. Um, and I love that. And I even... I had to see it in 3D, unfortunately. Still look good. Didn't nothing really like popped at you. Whatever. I don't know why 3D still a thing. Why the fuck is 3D still a thing? Cinema studios, stop it. It is a waste of time. It's a waste of time. <laughs> and a lot of people wear glasses. Fuck you. Um, <laughs> but no. Uh, Story wise, you know, s- straightforward for the most part. Uh, very left in the way of hey, we can go towards other stories. And there is an, a mid credit scene. No spoilers. Um, I love that this is the first, I feel like it's one of the first ones, movies that isn't directly dealing with, like, the Foot Clan. Um, right? Foot? Yeah, Foot. Because Hand is Daredevil. Um, mm-hmm. uh, 
so yeah, it's it's literally just the enemy is the um the other mutants. Uh which is cool. I mean we get fucking Baxter Stockman right off the bat. Uh we get all these super or these all all these mutants that have spanned the entirety of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Um and I will give almost all of them credit, first of all, biggest shout outs to the four kids Sorry, the four teenagers that are fucking voicing the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, in the first time ever where they're actually being voiced by fucking teenagers. Uh, (laughs) um, But, like, shout out to just about every other voice actor in this movie. I thought they were great. All of them did a great job. Uh, I'm just fully calling bullshit on two people. Um, I want to make sure who's everybody. Okay, yeah. Um... Ice Cube, Ice Cube is just talking. Ice Cube is just Ice Cube in this movie. He's not putting in any kind of, like, change into his voice to be super fly. Uh, Which, I don't know how much voice acting experience Ice Cube has done. Um, He doesn't have a lot. Yeah. Um, Ice Cube has also fallen off for other reasons, so... (laughs) Oh, fun. Um, The other one is... Again, and we knew this was going to happen because he's been very open about the fact that he doesn't put any fucking effort into his voice acting. Yeah. Fucking Seth Rogen. Like, yes, yeah. this was his movie. Whatever. He's Bebop. he's Bebop, and he's just Seth Rogen coming out of Bebop's mouth. Mm-hmm. Um, now, to counter that, you have Rocksteady, voiced by John Cena. John Cena, fucking great. There's a, he changes the voice a little bit more gruff. I don't know if it's like a, a voice changing mm-hmm. thing, but it's specifically not just John Cena's voice. Um, can you tell it's John Cena? Yes, but John Cena is... Oh, I hate that I'm saying this. John Cena's a better actor. <laughs> well, here's the thing. So, here's the crazy thing about John Cena, right? If You kind of have to pay attention to his, his history, his, his career, mm-hmm. you know, as a so, rapper. Well, <laughs> not as a rapper. Don't pay attention to that part specifically. You don't see that? Um, <laughs> but, you know, coming off the WWE, being a pro wrestler, and then getting into acting, he talked a lot about how he's been influenced by other actors to kind of perfect his craft. Mm-hmm. Um, very much talked to, you know, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, about, like, how he made such a smooth transition from WWE to professional actor, right? Um And the stuff we've seen John Cena in, like, okay, like one of his first, I guess you could say, well-known movies was The Marine. I knew you were going to bring up that movie. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not a good movie by any stretch of the imagination. But then he stopped, he started realizing, hey, I can branch out of the, you know, typical generic action stuff Mm -hmm. and do what I want to do. And, like, he's been on so many podcasts and so many news, news shows Um, and has spoken about his career, but also just himself as a person. If you saw John Cena, like, if you saw someone who looks like John Cena walking down the street at like any time of day, like just his build, the way he looks like you're going to make some assumptions about him. All that goes out of the window when I hear John Cena talk, um, you know, people who have expected certain things out of him have become shocked and realized like, no, he's actually just a decent human being all around. Yeah. Um, and he brings that into his acting. And so for him to do something like rock steady, like this is one of those things that I know John Cena was like sitting around one day and is like, damn, I wish I could be in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. <laughs> <at some point." laughs> Motherfuckers in Barbie. Um, yes. <laughs> God damn. Uh, no, he, he, in my opinion, is probably the second best of the like wrestler turned full time, or I guess full time. Yeah. Full time actor. Um, I think Batista is probably the best, in my opinion, Um, because I've seen him in more of a range of roles. Um, It's not always comedic action star. It's he has some more heartfelt and serious parts. Um, Mm -hmm. Obviously, if you only see him as Drax, sure, you're only going to think he can do one thing. Uh, Well, even Drax can do more than one thing. Yeah. By the end, they get to let they let them let him be a a father again, kind (laughs) of. Spoilers, did we ever talk about Guardians of the Galaxy? I don't know if we ever did Guardians of the Galaxy. I think that was during the the weird times. Mm -hmm. Um, Whatever. Anyway, um, (laughs) another shout out Jackie Chan. Love Jackie Chan. 
mm-hmm. I think one of my favorite parts in this movie is there's an entire fight sequence. So, in this timeline, fuck it. I Whatever. Tiny spoilers. Who cares? It's fucking a Turtles movie. Because in usual canon, he was a human that was, like, really good at fighting, right? I believe so. I well, think... No. I think... I mean, I can't remember. What I remember is... So, my experience with TMNT back in the past was not extensive, right? Like, I caught the TV show whenever it was one... It was cool. It was another you know Saturday morning cartoon for me. Um, when the live action movies came out, in that movie, I believe he was just a rat who also drank the ooze. Um, oh, Splinter is the, okay. So in the original movies in live action, or sorry, live action in comics, Splinter is the pet rat of a ninja named Hamada Yoshi. Uh, intelligent yeah. for his species, Splinter is able to learn ninjutsu art by mimicking his master's movement while he practices. Yoshi becomes embroiled in despair. Blah, 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 whatever. Um, okay, cool. Because uh, then in the animated series, they are the same person. That's what my brain was remembering. Yoshi mm-hmm. was Splinter. He just became yeah. whatever. Um, cool. Uh, in this just a normal rat straight up normal rat not owned by anybody doesn't have any skills no knowledge previously um what happens is he and the in the boys have an experience with humans um that makes him hate and feel scared of them never wants to go near them doesn't want to put his children in danger um this is like all in splinter is their dad it's not so much he says their master or whatever it is straight up they call him dad throughout the whole movie. And I think it's great. I love the the relationship between him and the turtles. Um, mm-hmm. So the way that they learn is he literally just watches videos on TV. Um, like they, they, hey, he steals VHS tapes and just goes through like all this shit to teach the turtles everything. Um, so obviously he's learning it at the same time. I think it's adorable. I think it's great because they aren't like officially trained turtles or uh, ninjas. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're really good at being turtles. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> but later on in the movie, there is a fight sequence where Splinter is just straight up doing what if it was a Jackie Chan fight scene, but it was a giant rat instead of Jackie Chan. <laughs> it is fucking brilliant. Um, mm-hmm. Like I never, I didn't even think about that being a, a possibility of them just being like, you know what? We're going to make this a Jackie Chan fight scene. Um, and it's so goddamn good. Uh, there's an ongoing joke <laughs> joke through the entire movie that has a fan fucking tastic payoff. Um, not gonna spoil it. It's one of those like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" kind of moments. Um, and I couldn't say that out loud because there were children in the audience around me. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I think it was a really good, and I'm hoping we get multiple movies out of this. Like, I'm hoping this is at least a trilogy. I think it looked great. I think the story was a, a perfect starting point. Um, it introduces the turtles to the world, both for them into the human world and the human world into there's weird shit around, and sometimes the weird shit is good. Um mm-hmm. Oh, weirdly, and I kind of had the same feeling for... Uh, this is kind of the same critique I had of um, oh, Charlie Day as Luigi. Charlie Day is just Charlie Day doing Luigi. It worked yeah. for some reason. Paul Rudd is just Paul Rudd, but it works as uh, Mondo Gecko because mm-hmm. it's like Paul Rudd when he's acting like cool, cool guy Paul Rudd, like hip dude, like bro kind of. Paul Rudd and it fucking works so good um in 1000% I can only see Mondo Gecko as my friend Jamie the guy who painted the the thing in my background the uh, abstract <laughs> Disney um and I keep meaning to tell him that I'm like dude you you're in this fucking movie uh cause he also he <laughs> loves Mondo Gecko he Mondo Gecko is like literally he, I think he that is like his favorite turtle character um mm-hmm. god damn it was so fun uh I, I think I'm proud of this is both of these movies. I'm definitely the moment they go out digitally. I'm like, boop, add into the family library. Um, which, but, <laughs> yeah, uh, we'll talk about that later. Um, yeah, highly recommend both these movies. I think I gave Turtles a four out of five. 
Let me mm -hmm. let's go over to Letterboxd. Let's let's go check out my Letterboxd account. See what I gave. Credentials don't match. Just suck my dick. <laughs> did it match that time? It did, you motherfucker. Um, profile. Last things I watched. Activity. Why does it only show the one goddamn thing that I... I sometimes hate this website. Okay, yeah. Um, I gave... Why is it sorted? That is such a weird way to sort it. You know that? Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, I gave Turtles a 4 out of 5, and I gave uh, Talk to Me a 5 out of 5. Um, hmm. Which, you know, that's literally the, a step between great and incredible. Um, <laughs> I, I have things I like, and that is definitely one of the things that I like. Uh, I, yeah, I literally, in the review, I only wrote Holy Fuck for... Uh, talk to me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say that I did look through some of the uh, some of the trailers before, um, not really before Turtles. There's nothing really new animation wise that I'm super excited about. Um, mm -hmm. But before uh, talk to me, there were a handful of trailers that I'm like, ooh, this looks great. Um, oh man, today was $4 ticket all day for National Cinema Day if you wanted to go see a movie for $4. It's a little late now. I guess you can still yeah. see the movies. Um, but yeah, I saw the trailer for one, the new Exorcist movie. Fucking looks terrifying in the best way possible. Um, <laughs> there's a way you can see tickets. Yeah. Revisit accompanying trailers. Okay. Um, one, I re-cement my feelings on the fact that I don't give a fuck about Scorsese. Uh, because there's a trailer, there was a trailer for Killers of the Flower Moon. I'm like, this looks horrible. Um, mm. I finally watched the trailer for Poor Things, which is uh, the new movie by the guy that made The Lobster. Um, mm -hmm. Fucking weird-ass looking trailer kind of excited to see it uh i also saw oh yeah new trailer for this movie drive away dolls which um basically these two girls go on a road trip and accidentally pick up a car that has um something bad in it that like the mob or some gang is after them for uh Looks really mm -hmm. fun. Looks like a little fun, fun romp. Uh, <laughs> uh, but then horror movie wise, uh, of all the things that played ahead front, there's a trailer for It Lives Inside, um, which I I can't even describe the plot behind it besides spooky demon kind of shit. And um, I definitely recommend checking out that trailer. It looks really fucking good. Uh, it is definitely on my list of I am excited to watch this in theaters and be scared. Um, mm. that'll be my next I watch this and then also have to watch some happy movie at the same time <laughs> let's see September 22nd movie releases what what, what do I have to, to match this up with this year <laughs> movie's coming out September 22nd um, I will watch this along with Ooh, doesn't look like there's anything really <laughs> really happy I don't know if I'm gonna be able to see this movie hopefully something else comes out beforehand <laughs> let's see what's the week before uh, shit man where's all the happy movies where's the kids movies <laughs> I need to pair up my, the way my brain works I can't leave I'm definitely not seeing Paw Patrol fuck it's fucking Hollywood see Hollywood season of darkness <laughs> Nobody's seen Paw Patrol, man. Are you kidding I... me? That movie's gonna make bank. Oh, great. Well, <clears throat> I'm glad I am leaving America in a couple months. <laughs> Not even a couple months, a couple weeks, then. <laughs> Why you say it like that? It's a, kids, it's a kids movie, Nate. It's a kids movie about a very specific occupation. <laughs> Only one of them is a cop. Okay. <laughs> the rest of them are, like, firefighters and, like, I don't know, other emergency 
They should probably gang up on the one that's a cop. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Yeah, you know what the really fucked up kind of thing is? Um, The the movie's main villain is just some black girl with colorful hair. Yeah, I know. I saw a trailer for it. I know. Okay. (laughs) Hold on. I want to go to the Wikipedia to see how much that fucking movie made. All right, Paw Patrol the movie. Oh, okay, yeah, we got the Mighty movie coming out. Paw Patrol the movie m- had a budget of twenty six million, box office of one forty four point three million. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I'm pretty sure that was successful. Um, Mighty Mo- movie doesn't have okay, it doesn't have a uh, box office hit. Whatever. <sighs> All right, Nate. <laughs> what? <laughs> Nothing. Okay, just, fine. Just Paw Patrol. Mm-hmm. I, don't know. I prefer Bluey. I pref- I prefer. Something. Well, as long as it's not Coco Melon. No, not Coco Melon. What's the kid with cancer? Caillou. I don't know. They're entire. He doesn't I'm really have... at the casting list now. And like almost this entire casting list is the list of people who haven't had jobs in Hollywood for a while. Wait, hold on. Paul, was the movie Mighty Movie? Yes, you've got James Marsden in there, Kristen Bell, Dak what, Shepard. Well, what are you talking about, James Marsden? That's fucking Donut Lord. Oh well, that's true. He is Donut. How Lord. dare you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, he was also he... multiple seasons of. He was in all, every season of Westworld. Well, I didn't watch Westworld, so... Nate, people exist outside of what you consume. I know that. <laughs> I, I anyway. Saw, motherfucker, he was in the Pony movie. I know he was. Mm-hmm. Um, he plays Hitch Trailblazer. That's your favorite character, right? Not really. I don't even know who uh, that is. <laughs> the last thing Dak Shepard was in was in a movie called... Or no, a show with three episodes called Stoner Cats. Okay. Second of all, uh, mm. I, I will. Um, Tyler Perry is in this. Wait, hold Jimmy on. Where? I'm not seeing him listed. I'm just looking at IMDb. Oh, weird. Because I see like McKenna Grace and Taraji P. Hansen. Okay. Well, I mean. Tyler oh, Kim Perry Kardashian. Are enough to yeah, Kim Kardashian. Oh, is this the I mean, first movie? The fact that Jimmy Kimmel is allowed to be in anything anymore is surprising. Um, oh, you kidding, man? He is like one of the one of the people that actually people enjoy watching their late night. <laughs> he he's weirdly respected. You know what? He really made a turnaround from being on the Man Show. Let's put it that way. I certainly hope so. I give him credit. Um, oh, sorry. I, I happen to be on the uh, morning spoilers page. I didn't realize I saw that open. Uh, supposedly, Star Wars Ahsoka has already been uh, greenlit for a second season. Uh, as well as The Acolyte, which hasn't even fucking started. <laughs> Disney's like, look, we got money. Go make the thing. <laughs> I mean, the whole point was they were trying to go back on some of it. Um, Nate, have you watched any of the new Futurama? No, I have not. Okay. Were you ever a big Futurama fan? Yes, actually. I watched pretty much all of Futurama. Okay. I kind of fell off. I have an entire DVD box set of Futurama. (laughs) Oh, damn. Um, Okay. Okay, random thing, just to bring it up, and then you can go into the actual conversation about it. Uh, Somebody's already modded GTA's CJ into Armored Court, the new Armored Court. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. it looks hilarious. Uh, I think it's fucking ridiculous. I love mods. It's great. Um, speaking of which, terrifying. Nate, how are you liking, what number is it, six? Six. Yeah. Armored so, Core, six fires of Rubik's Cube. <laughs> I am I am thoroughly enjoying it, honestly. Um, as someone who never really got into the newer Armored Core games, we're talking four and past that. Um, Armored Core six is a nice mix up of what I know about those newer generation armored cores and what I experienced, which was the older generation armored core games. 
Um, so it's a nice mix up between those two, just technically, mechanically, the way the game feels and how you play it. Um, but then also brings some things fresh and new to it that make it its own unique game as well. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I love everything about Armor Core. The, the thing that, the thing that I, I just don't understand from a lot of people, um, these people who have been from software fans for like a decade now, we're talking like Demon Souls and forwards. They just don't seem to want to give Armor Core 6 a try. And I get it if you're not into mech anything. Like, okay, you don't watch Gundam, you're not mech warrior fan, robots are are dumb to you. Sure, whatever. <laughs> um, but then there's so many people who won't give this a shot because they're like upset that it's not a fantasy game that From Software is making. Yeah. And it's like, okay, you can enjoy fantasy, but they're still allowed to do other genres of games. <laughs> um. I will say people who are from software fans and who enjoy from software mechanics are still going to enjoy armor core six at the end of the day. Yes. There is that aspect of needing to build a mech, but that's no different than you choosing what your build is in like a dark souls game. If you want to cast magic or if you want to use a big ass fuck off sword or whatever you want to do, <laughs> it's, it's the same fucking thing. <laughs> um, you're just doing it with individual parts of a big robot instead of, Hey, here's a cool piece of armor or a sword I got from a boss. Um, <clears throat> Again, I can, under but I also understand why it's not for everybody. Armor Core 6 is not a game about exploration. It's not a game about discovering a world or going off on an adventure or any of that. Um, I should stress this because it's something that carries over from other titles. In Armored Core, you are not a hero. Mm -hmm. You are not someone who's like looking for redemption or fighting some great evil or anything like that. You're a mercenary. And in Armor Core 6, even less so, because someone else is picking all the jobs for you. Um, you fight for corporations, and they pay you money for it. Sometimes you do a mission for one corporation to fight another corporation, and then you do another mission where those roles are reversed. Oh, you don't fun. care who you work for as long as they're paying you. <laughs> so... <clears throat> I mean, that's if I go all the way back to Armor Core 3, one of the very first missions in that game is to invade a factory, to infiltrate a factory and kill striking factory workers. <laughs> like, oh. that is the game. <laughs> what the fuck is this game? <laughs> it's So, the whole thing about Armored Core, and this is why I say it still relates to the Soul series a lot, is the tone of Armored Core has always been a cold and distant one. You are there to do a job. You're not there to take sides or to make decisions. You're there to complete whatever missions people are paying you money for. Mm -hmm. And that's why in that very first mission of Armored Core 3, when you're assigned to go kill those factory workers, it isn't just like, oh, kill like these defenseless people. The corporation that's hiring you is trying to justify why they need this done. Mm -hmm. And that ties mm -hmm. into the wider lore of the game. Um, on top of that, they will try to kill you. They have weapons. Like, they're not going to sit around and just, like, take it from you. They're going to try to destroy you, too. <laughs> um, they're no match for you at that point in the game, but they're not in complete pushovers, either. Um, in Armor Core 6, though, everything is... It's not really dialed up to 11 or anything like that. The movement, the action, that's all dialed up. The story is still very much the same. You were there, you're given missions, you're going to go on these missions, you're going to complete these objectives. And because Armored Core has always told its story through those missions, no one's going to, like, exposit at you what's really going on here. You're going to figure that out as you play the game. Um, <clears throat> and then it's up to you to decide whether or not any of that is important to you, personally. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that sort of sort of gets me here, and it's funny to me, is... For so long, I, I put off games like Soulsborne games, like Elden Ring, just because I did not enjoy the core tenet behind roguelike games, where, you know, you progress a little bit, you come up against the wall, you get beat, you reset, and you try it again. Um, <clears throat> Armor Core 6 makes that much more approachable, and the fact that, yes, they've added checkpoints, 
Um, no, there's no penalty for, for losing a mission in this game, unlike previous Armor Cores, where if you failed a mission, that mission was just gone and you took the debt. Mm -hmm. um, this one is you die and it's like, all right, let's reload, change my loadout. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. you can do that. This game is more forgiving than other Armor Cores. That being said, I found those same people who were on the whole get good bandwagon for Dark Souls for so long struggling to beat the very first boss of this game. <laughs> and they are furious about it in the Steam <laughs> discussion <laughs> discussion boards. They're like, all the bosses are broken, they're so unbalanced, so on and so forth, and it's like, none of them actually are. Anyone can jump online right now and watch a YouTube video of someone decimating the last boss in like 30 seconds. Jesus. It's <laughs> Once you know what you're doing, and once you have access to the parts to accomplish that goal and learn how those parts mechanically work together to achieve a result, you're, you will raffle stop everything in this game. Um, but that's the same way it is with any classic RPG. Once you get powerful enough, nothing can touch you in Skyrim. By the time you're like level 20, you're basically a fucking demigod. Um, <laughs> so, you know, it's just a matter of figuring that formula out, figuring out what works. I, again, I understand why people swear the game off. If you don't like mechs, you don't like mechs. I can't change your opinion on that. Yeah. Um, but if you like Souls formula games, that is where this game kind of sits. It is different than those other Souls games, but you can still see a lot of the simul similarities there. And for me, like, the fact that From Software even considered bringing this franchise back was huge. They took a gamble on this, honestly, coming off the back of something like Elden Ring. Mm -hmm. um, they knew that Armored Core was always a niche franchise. They knew that Armored Core did not receive the best critical reception or commercial reception in the past. Um, but they also knew, hey, we built up this following, we perfected our craft of game design to a certain point. We want to go back to what our bread and butter was before we got into the whole Demon Souls and Dark Souls and Bloodborne thing. Um, we want don't, to don't go mention back... Bloodborne. People are very upset about it. Well, I'm sure. But they wanted to go back to a series they know and love, and all I have is nothing but praise for them for it at this point. Um, yes, there are things about the game I don't like, but it is through my own sort of tenacity that I'm learning to overcome those dislikes and adapt, which is what the game wants you to do. It's what every Souls-like game wants you to do. Um, and so, yeah. Just, if you haven't tried it, I would encourage you to at least try it. Um, you know, if you can get a hold of it on Steam, you know, and refund it within that refund window, do that. If you can get a hold of a demo somewhere, try that. Do they, I was about to say, do they have a demo? Let me. They actually did not release a demo. Okay. Um, and that's, I know again, demos. Demos are rare nowadays. <laughs> well, demos are rare because they're always a double-edged sword. Um, you release a demo and yeah, it gets people excited for your game, but also if the demo doesn't play well, then a lot more people become less excited for your game. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know. I'm enjoying it. I plan on streaming it some more recording. I'm recording that footage while I stream it so I can cut it up for a let's play or whatever. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm just, I'm having a great time with it and I expect to continue having a great time with it, no matter how frustrating it might be. This is probably the single hardest armored core game I've ever played. And that's coming from a game like three, where the last mission is a true test of endurance. It is the single longest mission I've ever played in an armored core game. And even with the best mech I could build it, build at the time, I was surviving with something like 5% of my HP left by the end of the mission. Um, <laughs> so, and virtually no ammunition at that. Yeah. <laughs> um, now I was gonna say, I know it's, it's not, and I know that's one of the we, you already mentioned the whole like it's not like Souls games. Um, do you at least feel some or, or, or like some influence of the Souls games of the last few years? Oh, absolutely. Um, the director of this game even talked about that a bit. How they are bringing in elements from things like Elden Ring and Sekiro and the Souls series. Um, the biggest obvious thing that's a carryover from Sekiro is the stagger bar. You have one, and your enemies have one. And when you do oh, stagger... Oh, yeah, I think you mentioned this last time. Or... Yeah, so, no. Oh, yes. Maybe? Maybe. 
I remember you speaking of this in some form, whether it was on a podcast or not. I don't know. Well, I I can't remember. When you do staggered enemy, though, yes, it gets temporarily interrupted in its movement, but you also deal a whole lot more damage to it while it is staggered. Um, So staggering and managing your own stagger is a big mechanic of this game. Mm -hmm. Different parts contribute to how well you can resist being staggered and how fast you can recover from being staggered. Um, so you have to keep that in mind when you're building your mech as well. you got to keep in mind your weapon choices. Some of them have more impact versus more raw damage. So all of that, you know, you take into account while you're playing the game. Um, of course, one of the other big obvious influences from the previous games are these big boss fights where you have these bosses that seem completely overpowered, completely insurmountable, will just wreck you until you learn what their mechanics are learn how to adjust your build better to defeat it, adjust your tactics, your mechanical skills better to defeat it, and then eventually overcome it. I, I mean, that very first boss that I that people are so upset about, I died the first time I tried fighting it. Yeah. Like, it, it fucking flat out destroyed me. I had no idea how to approach this boss. On the second try where I beat it, like, I barely got through. And then when I went back on my own off stream and played it again... When you replay the mission, when you replay that specific mission, you cannot play it with a mech you've customized. You play it with a starter build. So you have no like upgrades or anything special to do this with. You play it with your starter build. I beat that boss in like 15 seconds after encountering it. I got a full S rank on that mission without even <laughs> trying that hard. Like, again, it's just that little bit extra to push forward and learn from these bosses, which is bought over from those games. If I go all the way back to Dark Souls 1, I mean, this helicopter in Armor Core 6 is the Asylum Demon in Dark Souls 1. Mm-hmm. Like, it is there to teach you, like, hey, if you just try to bum rush, bum rush every boss in this game, it'll fuck you up. Armor Core 6, on the other hand, kind of flips the script, where it says, hey, if you don't bus, bum rush this boss, it'll fuck you up. <laughs> so, That's actually kind of funny. <laughs> literally, mm-hmm. you would think... I mean, it's totally counterintuitive. I'll, I'll just give you the hint, anybody who may listen. To beat the helicopter, melee the shit out of it. <laughs> Fly up to it and just beat it to death. <laughs> okay. All right. Yeah, this is it's definitely a game that I will never experience. Uh, I've never been a mech fighter fan. Um, the only time I've ever enjoyed it is when, you remember the arcade games where you, when it was like a VR thing where you brought it over your head yeah. and you're like, oh, yeah. that was fun. Um, but overall, it's just never been my fan, my thing. And that's okay. You don't have to like everything. Let people not like things and let other people like them. Um, it's, yeah, it's just the easy way of putting things. Uh, but yeah, all right. Well, hey, like I said, I unfortunately have not really played anything much. What I did play, uh, as long as it still shows that I played it, maybe, I don't know. There were two things that I've actually played. Um one of which, uh, both, both of these, again, because it's me, and I haven't really had time, so I've only been playing Game Pass games, um, but I just recently played a little bit of The Book Wall- Walker, Thief of Tales. Um, very interesting game, very much not what I was expecting, because I knew nothing about this, really. Um, and the way that this game basically plays is... You go on missions, you have individual missions that you, your character, jumps into the world of a book. Um, you don't know anything about the book, you experience the book within a different kind of isometric world. Um, it's very point-and-click adventure game with uh, with fighting thrown in there, like turn-based battles. Um and it's that one that, like, you know when you see, it's like, okay, this person's next turn is a hit, this person's next turn is a is a weight. I don't know how, the, whatever that style of fighting is considered. Um, that is partially where it kind of lost me. Um, it is fun, the, the aspect of jumping into these worlds, and it's like, oh, hey, you need a, a, a pickaxe. Not pickaxe, a, um, a lockpick. You need a sledgehammer, so you have to jump back into the real world. Oh, and hey, here's my here's my lockpick. Oh, my neighbor has a sledgehammer. Let me go borrow it from him. Um, so once you're back in that world, it is a first person first person like roam around kind of play uh, game style. 
Um, and I'm like, okay, that's interesting. I love that that little connection between the two things. Um, the it, the fighting gameplay is kind of where I lose it loses me, um, just because that's that's not my kind of gameplay. If it was very much like solve these puzzles, um, avoid conflict kind of thing, I would probably enjoy it a lot more. Um, mm-hmm. I like the 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 weird in and out of the the book storytelling seemed really interesting um you the first world you go into there is this person on basically a, a in in world walkie talkie is the best way i can think of putting it um that knows the story knows that they are a character in the story uh in like talks about the facts like oh yeah you don't know the twist of this book and he's like no 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 spoilers um and i thought i'm like oh that's that's so funny i like the the back and forth that you you're the main character and this this voice has um but really ed like i said i got through got to the gameplay of like actual combat and that's kind of where the the game was like ah if it wasn't for this i'd probably go into a lot more so i jumped out uninstalled it um what i had been playing after is a game preview game uh, again, also on Game Pass. I don't know if there's multiplayer. I want to see if there's multiplayer. I feel like it would be fun. Um, but mm-hmm. it's a game called Tectonica, which is, so far at least, basically, what if it was the gameplay of uh, Satisfactory without combat, but you're underground like in... Uh, What's the other one? Deep Rock Galactic? Yeah. Yeah. So mash up Satisfactory, Deep Rock Galactic, but get rid of the combat. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh, this is a perfect game for Chris. Because um, I love I love non-combat games. I love resource collecting. I love building out my base without having to worry about dealing with other people. Um, mm-hmm. It's just the way my brain works. Don't fuck with me, okay, man? Let me build in peace. Uh, <laughs> that's why very much I enjoy playing Minecraft on peaceful mode. It's just relaxing. I'll play it on normal mode when I need to, but you know, it's fun too. Uh, but no, I, I've really enjoyed that. I have not gotten in much, much time with it, maybe like two or three hours. Um, but again, it is on game pass. It is currently in game preview. So it's not like final version of it or anything. Um, mm-hmm. it does seem to have some online co-op. Um, I don't know if it's just online co-op or if it is online co-op, online multiplayer. Uh, it is cross-play, but that's just everything at this point, especially when it comes to Xbox games. Um, so that might be something that could be fun to play, uh, maybe on stream or something like that. Um, I got a lot. I've got so much. I've been installing some stuff that I want to get around to, uh, might play some, some, uh, stream some of the games on stream once i get more things set up um but yeah i, I you know i recommend the one uh if you like the turn base if you like turn based if you like point and click action or point and click uh adventure games maybe check out the book walker um it's a fuck it was it called book walker i forgot um yeah the book walker <laughs> uh i, I want to call it the book thief because it's the book walker thief of tales um but yeah and then you got like I said, Tectonica, if you enjoy resource gathering, res- building out a base, coming up with like the easiest and fastest way of doing things. If you like skill trees, there are skill trees in this. And yes, the skills are technically just more and more tech, but still fucking fun. Um, highly recommend it. Uh, I could definitely get lost in it. I may have gotten lost. I think I wanted to play like an hour of it and I'm like, oh, it's been a few. Uh, <laughs> just cause that's how I am. That's how I got through like all the way up to Enos Lobby. You don't know that yet. Ignore the words that I'm saying, but it is great. Um, yeah, check it out. Hopefully I can get Nate in with me. He usually likes those kind of games, too. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's really all I played. Uh, <sighs> so, Nate... Um, it's not that I'm trying to skip your thing. It's like I want to try and keep new... Like, oh, no. you know, we don't um, have to do this. One. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, anyway, what also happened last week, Nate, was we had opening night live, which in the past has been really fun. Some really cool announcements and news and shit. 
uh, I was planning on streaming, live streaming it, reacting and all that, um, but at last second, I, I was kind of feeling eh, so I'm like, fuck it, I'll just watch, and I watched, and I'm so glad that I didn't live stream it, because goddamn, was it boring as fuck this year. Um, <laughs> I feel like there wasn't really any huge news, like he, he said ahead of time, um, mm -hmm. it was gonna mostly be about things we knew about, maybe some dates, uh, no super new announcements. Um, one of the biggest announcements, uh, in my opinion, was they announced... Actually, two two semi-big announcements. One, Killing Floor 3. They announced Killing Floor 3. Didn't think that was ever coming back. That's kind of awesome. That game is a... It's not like the greatest series of all time. It is just a ridiculous, fun multiplayer game. Um, if you like non-stop, crazy amounts of action. Uh, yeah. So yeah, looks fun. Um, more importantly, a different three was announced. Uh, they announced Little Nightmares 3. Uh, oh boy. Yeah, showed off a little co op spoopy adventure. Um, now, Is it going to be three player co op this time? <laughs> no, just two player. Um, I will say the weird thing about this is the original creator of Little Nightmare left after the second one and said that they he there was no plans for a third one. Um, mm -hmm. And then this is the newer team that basically is going to create new stories and continue the franchise. So I don't know how it's going to turn out, if it's going to be in line as good as the first two. Um, I have only played the first one, and I've seen bits of the second one. I haven't even beaten the first one, but what I've played, I've, like, I've really enjoyed. Actually, if you watched last year's, uh, the ending of last year's Extra Life stream, that, that was what it was. I played through all of that game that I did on that stream, <laughs> and it was great. Um, just the night, a uh, perfect level of, of uh, creepy. Um, last thing I will point out or bring up, uh, I have never seen or heard anything about this game, um, but Pearl Abyss showed off a new trailer for... Uh, now, if you don't know Pearl Abyss, Pearl Abyss made Black Desert. Black Desert is a huge, huge online multiplayer game. Really in-depth character creation kind of stuff. Um, mm -hmm. But they showed off their new, what seems to be a single-player game, Crimson Desert. Is this the game with the horse drifting? This is the game with you can pet the dog, you can cuddle the cat, you can launch your horse off the side of a mountainside... And then turn into, like, a raven or some shit. Um, <laughs> it's y fucking... You watch this game trailer. It's a three minute, three and a half minute game trailer. I want to play the fuck out of this game. Um, <laughs> and, like, I got scared that it was just another multiplayer. Or, like, another Mamorpaga. Um, but thank God it was just, like... A gameplay trailer for a single player game because holy shit this look this game looks ridiculous will it be good who fucking knows um mm -hmm. but i definitely check check it out 100 percent. check this trailer out i might link it in the thing below um but yeah i, I definitely recommend at least checking out that trailer because it's literally three and a half minutes of like what the fuck is this game um <laughs> so yeah uh opening night live kind of a bust bleh whatever we're getting more game announcements there's so many fucking games so many things coming out um speaking of games coming out uh while it has continuously been pushed back uh internally it officially has not been announced as being pushed back again um the next dragon age was it dread wolves or whatever the fuck it's called yes supposedly Dragon's internally Dreadwolves. yeah internally has been pushed back multiple times um mm -hmm. but as well as that as not being officially pushed back uh nate what else has happened over at at uh at bioware <laughs> so uh bioware has had some shakeups and some changes that may have led to why a game like dragon age dread wolf got pushed back um well, just reading from the Kotaku article, um, they are downsizing um, on August 23rd, which was four days ago. It cut 50 rolls um, from its studio. It now, is still continuing production on two games, which 
Dragon Age Dreadwolf and Mass Effect 4. Yeah. Um, on on that, by the way, the 50 people, uh, they were a studio of 250 people. So they cut a fifth of their, uh, of their team. Um, yeah. Now this kind of comes after EA's uh, change, kind of, where for the longest time EA was one company, um, mm-hmm. but they have split from EA as a whole to EA Sports, and then EA, I, I think it's just entertainment, I can't remember what, how it actually breaks down, but it's basically everything that isn't making them money hand over fist. Um, mm-hmm. Sorry, I said that wrong, hand over foot, that was our old thing, wasn't it? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. I, this, this has been coming up multiple times this past week or so, or week, yeah, at this point. Um, mm-hmm. I well, will. Sorry, go ahead. Well, no. Um, I was just going to say it. Whenever announcements like this come out, um, it's layered in a lot of what I call corpo speak, which is pretty much its own language at this point. Um, anybody who's worked a customer service job where you have to send a lot of emails like I do, you have to kind of perfect this manner of speech. And so you learn to le- read between the lines. Um, what they told fans is they want to take a more agile and focused approach. They said, in order to meet the needs of our upcoming projects, continue to hold ourselves to the highest standard of quality, ensure Bioware can continue to thrive in the industry that's rapidly evolving, we must shift towards a more agile and focused studio. It will allow our developers to iterate quickly unlock more creativity and form a clear vision of what we're building before development ramps up. Which uh, kind of sounds like we just got rid of 50 of you better fucking haul ass. If you don't want to be part of the next 50. Um, exactly. Yeah. I, I hate the word. I've, the shift towards a more agile and more focused studio, a more agile studio. Just that. I hate that for some reason, the way that reads makes me want to punch somebody in the face. Well, the way it reads is we are just taking those 50 people's work and we're shoving it onto other people now. Yeah. Um, now, from what has been talked about, I, I've been seeing things of what is most likely happening is people that are on the Mass Effect team are being pulled from Mass Effect and now working on um, Dragon Age, which makes sense of trying to get it out a little bit faster. Uh, but that also means, one, we're already seeing delays for Dreadwolf that now is now those delays are going to pile up even more on mass effect. So we might not be, be even hearing about mass effect until probably 2025, uh, at this fucking point. Um, mm-hmm. and I mean, it has been years. It says, and I'm on the verge article, uh, Bio, uh, new lay- new news of the layoff come as Bioware is in the midst of development on the next mass effect title in dragon age dreadwolf, which was announced back in 2018 um and it's been silent for yeah before going silent for two years then last year at gamescom they showed a behind the scenes video which didn't really update much um but it did give us the the new title of dreadwolf um which Mm. for some reason in my head dreadwolf had to do with uh is that the witcher yeah witcher for some reason i thought dreadwolf had something to do with witcher but i don't don't know enough about that universe (laughs) um but so one thing that i don't know if it's mentioned in that article or in this article and i might just be missing it um they were they did state i don't know if it was on the bioware side or the ea side that they are um hopefully they are prepping them to hopefully find positions for these 50 people within ea at other positions in in the company um Mm -hmm. so uh, i didn't realize i had started talking about it but that whole breakdown kind of thing um, where EA Sport is now separate from all the other EA games, uh, it kind of has now redirected who the blame. I, the best way to say is, oh, hey, we're not making money. We're no longer blaming us, EA, up at the top. We are going to now blame individual studios for why aren't you making us more money? Why aren't you making us money? Why aren't you taking mm-hmm. cuts? Where are you cutting these people? Let us, let's save money by getting rid of people. Again, not people at the top being like, you know, I don't need three yachts this year. Let's drop it down to one. Um, <laughs> but no, we it's it's turning into, hey, we, because we no longer count EA Sports money, we are not making enough money. We are seeing a decline. Um, it has been 
talked about there's starting to be a decline, an unexpected, I guess, decline um, from Apex Legends. Uh, and really, there isn't much from EA that has been making the money aside from the Star Wars games. Because um, mm. obviously, you know, <laughs> Battlefield... <laughs> hasn't been doing battlefields in a hole that it's been trying to fight its way out of for years now, which is really upsetting because at one point I fucking love battlefield battlefield was my go-to. I fucking hated call of duty. I still kind of hate call of duty, but like, you know, it's playable. Um, <laughs> well, they're different styles of games. I mean, yes, they're both first person shooters, but the way you have to play them is different. Yeah. Um, um doesn't one have bullet drop and the other one doesn't? I remember that being something you complained about. Well, they both have bullet drop now. Oh, um, okay. Call of Duty used to have weapons that, you know, were basically just hit scan. Mm -hmm. um, and hit scan weapons were always kind of broken in any game you played. Um, but everything's moved over projectiles now just because engines have improved and that's what people wanted was more realism yeah. out of their gunplay. Okay. Now you have to lead and aim up a little bit. <laughs> I mean, for the most part, yes. At certain ranges, every gun's a laser. That even applies to real life. But um... yeah. but you're not going to shoot somebody with a shotgun from a football field away and get a headshot. Um... Um, shotguns are still the one thing that no game developer ever does right. Um... <laughs> what? <laughs> I mean, you're... the rounds you fire from a shotgun don't magically disappear after traveling like five meters. <laughs> <laughs> and that's every video game with a shotgun in it. At um, least, like, at least when, like, Halo has a shotgun, mm -hmm. you, like, they now, I don't think, I'm not sure if the regular shotgun's in it, but they have, like, the alien versions of the shotgun, the scatter shot, where, yeah. like, they literally dissolve. There's a reason oh, yeah. why the bullets don't keep going. It hits a point and it's like, all right, they naturally disappear. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the, the normal human shotgun is like okay within this range you have bullets outside of this range you might Nothing. as well be firing confetti yeah exactly <laughs> um <laughs> <laughs> oh man no uh it is it's upsetting to hear uh i hope everyone lands on their feet whether within the company itself within maybe not obviously bioware but other place positions in ea uh, and from what I've been seeing and what I've been hearing, it's not just like lower end of the people. These are some higher, higher up people within Bi Bioware, um, mm -hmm. which is unfortunate. Uh, it's always unfortunate for any of these layoffs. Um, it'd be great if they could fucking every fucking game company could unionize. Uh, but that's never going to happen because reasons. Um, hmm. Anyway. This isn't really laying off, but we are losing a lot of video games upcoming in the next year. Uh, Xbox 360 Store has officially been announced to be shutting down in 2024. Uh, yep. Nate, you got the news article up for a little bit more information? Well, I do. I actually have another news article up. This came after the announcement. No, no, no. Talk oh. about the other thing. Then we can talk about what Phil said later. Okay. Is, well, it, is it what I think it is? <laughs> it's just about preservation. Okay, cool. <laughs> Um, yes. Um, but yeah, so the the 360 marketplace, uh, the online marketplace, will be shutting down in 2024. Um, it seems that the heads at Xbox have decided that at this point, because at least according to their metrics, so few people are playing 360 games, even on newer hardware, um, that it's just not worth the expense for them to keep it open any longer. Um They've also seen that a lot of people have just migrated over to either a Series X or an S at this point and, you know, are no longer using that older hardware to play their games. Um, people like Phil Spencer believes ultimately PC is the platform for game preservation as a whole. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean... There, there are the, the big issue comes in that there are a select number of titles on 360 that have never come, have never been made backwards compatible with newer hardware. Um, there was a specific that, number around 220. It's around 220 games that are no longer backwards compatible, or I not should say, shouldn't say no longer. We're never backwards compatible yeah. for um, a multitude of reasons, and usually it comes down to legal. Yeah, it usually comes down to legal reasons or because those games were released in some form 
to have a version that works on newer gen hardware. Um, one of, if we just pick out like a couple of big titles on the list of uh, what Phil gave to Eurogamer in his interview, um, there are games on there like Life is Strange, um, Resident Evil Zero, uh, Tales from the Borderlands, uh, Wolf Among Us. There's another one on here that I'm not seeing. Wow, I didn't know it was all, basically all of the, uh, the, what are those things called? Um, Telltale games. Thank you, yeah. Yeah. Uh, most of, uh, upsetting for me is Bastion. I see Bastion on this list, but I believe yeah. that's on PC at this point. Bastion, yeah, Bastion is on PC. Um, there's a lot of Telltale games, a lot of narrative games. Um, there's also a lot of... <gasps> games Cloudberry Kingdom! <laughs> yeah. Child of Light, uh, Duke Nukem 3D... Uh, Dust and Elysian Tale, so on and so forth. There's a lot of stuff here um, that's just not backwards compatible. A lot of these games have been released as newer versions, like I said, that are available in next gen hardware, but that mm -hmm. usually means you're rebuying a game you've already owned before. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> now, some of these, so, are, from what at least this list I'm coming across, it might be the wrong list, but um, some of these, see, I feel like, are already on PC, uh, which, yes, you still would have to buy it again. Um, but like a handful of these, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure like Child of Light, uh, The Bridge, Brother of Tales, Two Sons, I'm pretty sure almost all of these, if not all of them, that not definitely not all of them, but a good portion of them are available on PC. Yeah. Well, what was it? If we, well, to put a date on this, so specifically that game store, the 360 game store will shut down on July 29th of 2024. Mm -hmm. So you have a little less than a year if you really feel compelled to buy games from that marketplace up until that point. And real quick, I know you'll never hear this. Maybe I can get in touch with your friend. Uh, Gerard, Mr. Mr. Completionist, don't. You don't have to buy <laughs> every single one of these. It might be a little bit easier than it was on Nintendo. Don't do it again. Don't put yourself through that again. All right, sir. Well, Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, I mean, it's sad to see it go. Um, games preservation has been a topic of discussion amongst the gaming community for a while. Um, especially in circles like Nintendo, who just seems to, seems to be clutching pearls so desperately that it stops making sense after a certain point. Like, they just won't release certain games and make them available in digital marketplaces or th platforms like the Switch. Um, We're looking at you, uh, <laughs> Pokemon games. Yeah. The fuck, guys? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, Nintendo seems to be pushing people towards, like, hey, if you want to play those old games, go buy that old hardware, and good luck. Because who knows if it works or for how long it's going to continue to work. It's also, <laughs> in most cases, super fucking expensive. Okay. Um, Ridiculously. Um, and, I mean, <clears throat> they have done an okay job. I say an okay job because, again... Plenty of titles are not making there. Partially because of legality. The other side of it is more of like, we don't know the reason and there makes no, there is no sense. Um, mm -hmm. But they do have their online catalog where, hey, if you subscribe, which, sure, it's money, it's a monthly fee, whatever. Um, but you do have access to Nintendo all the way up to, at this point, N64, as well as um, Game Boy and Game Boy Advance games, which is cool. Very slowly releasing. Some games, it's not the ones we want. Um, mm -hmm. When it comes to Pokemon, the only handheld games that are available are the trading card game and I think maybe the the uh, puzzle game? I don't know. Um, <laughs> no red, blue, yellow. No s silver and gold. Um, mm -hmm. Which, sure, some of those have had remakes... But those at this point are on old systems too. Fire red and in leaf green, which is still funny to me that we got leaf green. Um, <laughs> didn't or came out on the fucking advance. Now, are we going to get the original? Or are we going to get the advanced version? Who knows? Um, mm -hmm. We're still at that point that there's a handful of Zelda games that aren't playable on the Switch. Um, and this is again at the end of the Switch's life. Yes hasn't been officially announced but we know at this point that there is a switch 2 or whatever the fuck the next console is going to be called uh in the works 
and we don't have all these games already ported over, and at least internally, it seems like everything that you get on the Switch will still be playable on the next handheld, or sorry, the next console. Okay. Uh, so, fingers crossed that we do get those announcements. I know, uh, probably, I think it was maybe a year ago at this point, Jeff Grubb, um, mentioned or had talked about the HD collection of both uh, Wind Waker and, I believe, Twilight Princess? Yeah. Um, that has never come around. He he is belie- he believes that it's just being held for some random fucking reason. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah. Uh, who knows where that's going to go. Um, I mean, for the most part, Xbox or Microsoft in general has done a, a better job than most uh, most of these uh, consoles have done when it comes to backwards compatibility. Um, the the amount of 360 titles and the amount of original Xbox titles that are still available and will continue to be available because that I don't think you mentioned while the 360 store is shutting any of the backwards compatible g- titles are still able to be purchased um, on current hardware on the xbox one on the xbox series series <laughs> um <laughs> it's just that the count the the 360 store itself is shutting down you'll still be able to download and play ones you've already purchased that's why it's the whole here's a year you can buy what you want um but sure. again hardware dies man uh i mean 360 is known for having it literally has a named named death basically for its console um so hoping that those will continue to play forever, not the greatest uh, greatest luck right there. Uh, I mean, do you still have a 360? No, actually. Yeah. Um, no, I when I had 360s and stuff like that, I was I was poor, and so um, a lot of it was me, you know, trading them in for newer consoles. Yeah. Um, yeah, I traded my 360 in to get the uh, Xbox One. Yeah, and so. Um, yeah, I mean, I understand, you know, okay, old hardware dies and goes away and so, so on and so forth. Um, but Phil Spencer had an interview with Eurogamer at Gamescom on the 23rd, um, and basically said to boil this down into a point, um, he is putting the preservation of games sort of at the top of his list of priorities right now. Um, he wants to kind of throw some resources behind this and make sure that, you know, he's not spurning the community by completely cutting people off from being able to play some of these 360 titles. Um, does that mean that he'll be, you know, working to bring some of those titles to PC? Mm-hmm. Um, or will he be working to, you know, maybe change pricing within the Xbox uh, One's marketplace and or Series X marketplace at this point, so that way some of those games that have been upgraded for backwards compatibility are a little bit cheaper to get a hold of. Um, will some of those games be coming to Game Pass? We don't know. Um, he's not made any concrete plans yet, but he is pretty clearly saying, like, hey, we do want to preserve these games for as long as humanly possible. We want to make sure people have access and can play them. Um, yeah, he's even in his in the interview, uh, he's quoted saying, um, just know that the list of 220 games is something that we see, and we would love to find solutions for those games to continue to play. Yeah. Um, I mean, and, there was, and, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was going to say, it's 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 a combination of, because obviously he is the head of Xbox, he is, it's going to be slightly that, like, hey, we're trying to alleviate this in a professional way without sounding like assholes. Um, but from what we have seen of Phil Spencer, I, I am also in the... the on the side of believing him. I, I believe that he wants to try and get as much of this available mm-hmm. as possible. Um, the, uh, like I was talking about, these some of these games are available on PC already. You mentioned that as well. Um, yeah. He mentions that part of it is is uh, a, a, an attachment to the hardware. Um, but mm-hmm. again, it's going to break. Hardware breaks. There's a reason we don't still play original games all the time. There's a reason why if you say you have a working original Nintendo, but you have to 
blow out the thing and blow out the cartridge and clean the cartridge and do about 20 different things before you can actually play the game, guess what? That means that hardware is degrading. At one point, it is not <laughs> going to work anymore. I give them props for being able to work as long as they did, but most disk drive-based consoles mm. definitely definitely die pretty fucking quick. Um, well, they die quickly, and on top of that, I mean, even the discs themselves have a limited lifespan. Yeah. Um, there will be a time where I'll no longer be able to play disc copies of what I have on PS2. Um, and that's not even because the console dies. I can get another PS2 pretty cheaply. Yeah. Um, but those discs eventually will wear out. Um, there's only so many scans, even CDs, which are rated for millions and millions of scans, mm -hmm. can still take. Um, <clears throat> you know, and God forbid anything actually happens to those discs. If they warp, get cracked, scratched whatever i mean tons of things can happen to them um even weirder for playstation there were two different types of discs and oh yeah. some consoles don't even read the other disc yep so there, there's a lot of a lot of strange things that can happen when we're talking about the realm of physical media um i've always been a big physical media active advocate as far as being able to hold something in my hands and say i own this hmm. i paid money for it it's mine and no one can you know strip a license from me and say i can't play it anymore but there also comes the other side of that, which is... <laughs> technically, well, if you technically. read the thing, it does say they can still strip it from you. Well, uh -huh. know, like, in the era of the PS2, what was going to happen? Like, <laughs> Sony's going to call someone to come to my house and take my copy of Onimusha back. Do it. Um, but, um, no, there's just... Again, there is that double-edged sword of the fact that this media eventually will degrade and will die. Um, and so... The preservation of media has to occur in the digital space. It has to occur on the internet. Um, that being said, this in July 2023, of, well, this year, um, there was a study done by the Video Game History Foundation um, yeah. and the Software Preservation Network that found that something like 87% of classic games um, are just kind of lost. Um, that some of these games may never be recoverable because they're the physical media for them is so rare or privately owned that like no one's going to take their copy of whatever it may be on the Coleco vision and give it up to somebody else to say, Hey, let us turn this into a digital thing to distribute and preserve. Yeah. Um, so it's just, it's sad because a lot of the stuff is being lost to time and it is usually in those moments where a game developer discovers like a really really old obscure video game that all of a sudden they get brand new ideas for new video games that they're going to make um and so yeah it's, it's sad to see that stuff go um there are organizations out there though and networks out there at least trying to make people aware that these games existed at some point so <laughs> that's that's about as good as that's about as good as it can get right now yeah uh, it is very disappointing um and I'm guessing that yeah, I was gonna say specifically the Video Game History Foundation is one of one of those um, groups that are trying to preserve as much as they can, um, which is fun. You can donate. They got a shop. You can buy merch. I like their color scheme. I'm a fan. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, games games should be protected like any other kind of art. Um, I think it should be preserved. Uh, unfortunately, people don't look at games the same way they do at um, random paint thrown at a wall. Sorry. I just hate Jackson Pollock. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it, I wish that all art was regarded in the same, uh, to the same standard. Um, and in all honesty, even great works of art that are technically preserved better probably should be handed a bit more uh oh, wow. or better or whatever what are you looking at oh that's true i didn't realize this so I, I was actually looking at their website just now um one of their largest projects is the preservation of game informer magazine yeah yeah <laughs> um i can't remember if it was them there is someone that uh you can join a thing that basically um you can you basically donate and when you donate you can get like random issues um 
that they have multiples of. Like, they will have, like, oh, we have plenty of these. We'll send these out to the people that have donated. And I can't remember if it was them or if it was somebody else. Uh, yeah. And I thought that was actually really cool. I personally wouldn't do it because I do not. I don't, I, oh, <laughs> I don't have room for that. I have to figure out where the hell I'm going to put my bookshelf that's going to be nothing but every single volume of One Piece at one point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but no, I, I thought that was a really cool idea. I love that. Um, again, that is something as dumb as you, you don't think about it, but I feel like that is something that should be preserved as well. Um, you know what? There's one bit of news that happened that we didn't bring up, um, and it's not so much sad, uh, it's just something that I guess we should have seen coming sooner or later. Um, I always forget how to say his name. No, that's it. Yeah. Uh, recently, it has been announced that Charles Martinet uh, has is no longer, no longer the voice. Martinet? I think it's Martinet. It's Martinet. Mm -hmm. uh, Charles Martinet is no longer the voice of Mario moving forward. Um, there's yeah. a new voice. I don't think they've announced who the new voice is, but if you heard the trailer for Mario Wonder and the trailer for the new WarioWare and thought, they don't sound the same. Um, it isn't just a new recording of him sounding different. It is a completely du a dude? Completely dude? Uh, completely new voice actor. Um Charles is staying on as, like, the Mario ambassador, so he'll still be in public appearances. He's still going to be everywhere. Um, motherfucker is literally the voice of... He, the, he's technically the father of Mario, in a way, because he voiced the dad in the movie. Um, <laughs> but no, he, he's played all of the, the Mario bros. Um, and I, I don't know if he was also Waluigi. Every time... Please. Every time I hear people talk about uh, Waluigi, I've never seen, or everybody talking about the voice actors, I've never seen people say him specifically. Okay, no, it is him. But for some reason, they don't leave him out whenever people are listening to the voices that he does. Holy um, shit. He was, <laughs> he was Parthenax in Skyrim. Oh, yeah. He is not just... Uh, oh, man. Not just... Now, I, now I'm really mad at all the people who killed Party Snacks. Oh, <laughs> I don't know who Parthenax is. No, Parthenax is this dragon you meet on top of one of the mountains in the main story, but people have his name is Parthenax, and so people have nicknamed him Party Snacks and stuff. <gasps> Party Snacks, oh, <laughs> Party Snacks the dragon. I like that. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, you scroll through his thing; he's voiced fucking everything: Baby Mario, Baby Luigi, Wario, Waluigi. Uh, Oh, he was in, in Kane and Lynch. He's fucking been in everything. Um, what's yes. the last last thing he's... Oh, the last voice he Dragon will have Ball done is Dragon Ball Legends. As he, Magenta. Yeah, Magenta is, I believe, from the new movie. I knew he had a connection to Dragon Ball because he has this... One of the pictures is him in like, this pink suit. Um, he's got like this big gold Cuban chain, is, but on the lapel of his suit, he's got a little red ribbon pin. <laughs> Yeah, Red Ribbon Army. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah, he is uh, one of the enemies and like the villain in the new movie, um, mm -hmm. which I haven't watched yet. I've heard things, just things. I don't want to say anything because it looks it's a weird fucking looking movie, because um, it, it looks like it's the entire movie is just cutscenes from a video game because it's CG. Like it still has the same style mm -hmm. to it, but it looks like it's just video game cutscenes because that's what they did for the video games basically um anyway yeah uh good for you charles enjoy your life go have fun um still working for for the mario for the nintendos uh but yeah well nate anything else you want to talk about before we get to the final segment of the podcast no i think we're all ready to wrap up all right well in that case before we go, it's time for No Context Recommendations. <laughs> and I don't have a thing. I lost the thing. I don't know where it is. We gotta deal with it like this. Fuck it. Woo! <laughs> uh, Nate, what's your No Context Recommendations? Uh, my No Context Recommendation, um, I'll say uh, country music. <laughs> um, you need to look for Pink Williams. <laughs> Pink Williams. Yes. Just okay. look him up on YouTube and look at the banner of his YouTube channel. <laughs> no context recommendation. 
uh, especially when you're, if you're on the East Coast or not that far from the East Coast, uh, just look up the Nirvana Experience too. No context. Mm. Just look up the Nirvana <laughs> Experience too. <laughs> Love you guys. You're the best. Okay, cool. Nate, you don't have to look that up. You know what that is. Um, doing it. <laughs> okay, cool. Well, anyway, thank you for stopping by for another episode of Space Time Talco. As always, you can find us on all social media. Just search Space Time Talco. You can find me everywhere. Just search Time Lord Burrito. You can find him on Threads and Instagram, right? Threads and Instagram. <laughs> can find me on Instagram. Fuck Threads. I'm done with Threads. Oh, okay, fine, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. Add a little teapot? Yes. All right, cool. See, I'm glad you don't have the 89 on that one. <laughs> um, fucking 89. Uh, that sounds weird because we're both 89s. Um, but yeah. Yep. What? Th threads. Not Threads. Sorry. The other thing. <laughs> Nate, do you want to be on Blue Sky? Do you want to join Blue Sky? I want to participate in no more social media. Alright, cool. That's why I haven't <laughs> given you an invite. I have like three at this point, and I'm like, I'm not giving it to Nate. He'll just hate it. Uh... <laughs> it's just... I'm so done. Everywhere... I know. Uh, Where else? Been, 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 been. Seven days later. Anyway, if you like what you see, what you hear, what we do, you can support us over on patreon.com slash spacetime taco, as well as the, the coffee link again i don't it's coffee link it's on the screen you can buy us coffee uh if you don't want to just send us money you can you could gift us things we have a throne Woo! throne list pops up over here magic uh and last but not least uh you know if you have uh twitch prime or sorry if you have amazon prime you also have twitch prime um and if you don't have either of those you can still support us over on, oh, that's weird. Oh, damn, it was almost that one. It almost timed up with the <laughs> comments. Damn it. Um, you can <laughs> subscribe to us over on Twitch. I think I think we still have it, right? It's not going. I know we haven't been streaming much lately. Uh, <laughs> we're working on that. We're going to start working on that. I got some games to play. I got some great ideas. Um, are any of them me just eating food on streams? Maybe. Why? Because I'm coming up with ideas. Who knows? Who wants to mukbang? Um it's a real thing. It's not a weird thing, Nate. Don't worry. Um, I know what it is. Okay. All right. All right. And I don't have the graphic up here for the actual stream, but it will be here for the YouTube upload. We are coming back this year for another 24-hour extra life stream. Charity stream. One of our favorite things. Nate's not going to be here because he hates me and he decides work's <laughs> more important. Um, but we are doing our no another 24-hour live stream. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> God damn it. Uh, we are doing it, and I just want to make sure I have the dates right because I changed them. Um, we are going for 24 hours starting Saturday, November 11th, until Sunday, November 12th. Uh, we are starting at, I believe, 9 a.m.? Uh, no, 8 a.m. We're just starting at 8 a.m. 8 to 8, November 11th. November 12th, I believe it's also one of those holidays for people that have fought in wars. Um, right? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, hey, make a weekend. Have You got some Veteran Day plans? Veteran Weekend plans? It's us. Our, uh, where are your plans? Uh, <laughs> and you'll be able to see the entirety of the basement, not just this, this stretch that comes back here. You'll be able to see what's over here for real. And what's over here for real. Anyway. I like using the space, Nate. It's my favorite <laughs> thing. Um, eventually, this won't be here. This this will be... Oh, this probably sounds horrible. I didn't think about that. Uh, eventually, this... I will be standing regularly because... Right now, um, this light is fucking obnoxious. So I kind of want to stop that. Instead, I'll just stand in front of it. Anyway, thank you for stopping in again. We love you. Go inside and play video games. Nate, you got a catchphrase? Nope. All right. <laughs>